Imagine you are standing at a busy port. Perhaps they import cargo, or perhaps they export resources. Whatever the case may be, giant ships appear static against the berth front. People and machines bustle about you, going about their daily work. You don't know it yet, but a wind is picking up. A vessel is passing, or a worn mooring line has been deployed. Whatever the case, suddenly, one of those ships does not appear so static, and with a loud crack, a line parts, and a person is dead. The terrifying part in all of this is that we don't even know how frequently this happens. Estimates from the data we have collected in Australia suggest that snapback events can happen at ports as infrequently as only a few times a year, through to once a day. Based on the throughput of these ports, and scaling by global shipping trade, we estimate that a snapback event occurs somewhere in the world every 8 to 48 minutes. One in seven of these events that interacts with personnel results in a fatality. You don't need to take me at my word on that. Here are the reports. People have been killed in ports by parted mooring lines. People continue to be killed in ports by parted mooring lines. My name is Jordan Butler, and I'm a maritime engineer with WGA in Australia. Over the past half a decade, I've been working with ports throughout Australia on snapback safety. Today, I want to tell you everything I've learned because together, I believe that we can solve the problem of snapback. But first, a definition. What is snapback? Snapback describes the recoil of a parted mooring line accelerated by its own tension. These events are catastrophic and violent in nature, with mooring lines frequently achieving transonic speeds. We've known about this for 80 years. Lieutenant Commander Edwin Parker, shown standing on the left, worked with his colleague John Wessler in the United States Coast Guard on this in 1966. The changes to synthetic fiber lines through the 50s and 60s, along with increasing vessel sizes, created an issue that came to be known as snapback. Parker and Wessler tested a variety of synthetic lines with surprisingly small diameters. However, even at just 25mm diameter, the destructive effects of snapback were demonstrated. Not only was their suspended barrier destroyed, so was their entire testing rig. Tubular steel was completely buckled by lines with cross sections 10 times smaller than what we use today. A decade later in Stuttgart, Germany, Klaus Feierer began working on the same problem. In his testing, he frequently identified mooring lines moving in excess of 200 meters per second, with the highest values exceeding 250 meters per second. A photo from his testing is shown on screen now. Fire's work showed that the energy in parted lines was less than what was stored in it under tension, especially in cases where the line did not break instantaneously. On the other side of the North Atlantic, in 1982, Kenneth Bidding continued the work of the United States Coast Guard at the Research Development Center at Avery Point, which you can see on screen now. Adopting a sophisticated test rig and high-speed cameras, Bidding was able to precisely measure snapback velocity and able to differentiate tip velocity from the average velocity of the line. Bidding found that the tip energy was 42% higher than the rest of the line. In 1986, George Prentice continued the work in the US, again identifying mooring lines in excess of 200 meters per second. He also reported that in one nine-month period, three US Navy sailors had been killed by these lines. The Oil Company's International Marine Forum, OCIMF, had also been looking into the issue. Their recommendations on snapback were the first to be published in industry guidance, appearing in Mooring Equipment Guidelines First Edition in 1992. Somewhat prophetically, they noted, These guidelines represent a recommended minimum requirement. They are not intended to inhibit innovation or future technological advances. Meg One detailed what has come to be known as snapback cones, 10 degree cones about the extent of the mooring line. The 10 degree cone was adopted based on line buckling, but importantly, on the deck of a vessel where the positions of mooring equipment do not change. 
Though port side snapback differs wildly to the deck of the vessel, where one needs to consider vessel motion, tides, and the influence of differing ships in a dynamic port environment. Even so, the snapback cones of mooring equipment guidelines became ubiquitous with port maritime engineering. Further, the cones were preserved in their representation in mooring equipment guidelines second and third editions. Parted mooring line velocity was never mentioned in these documents. The performance of barriers was never mentioned in these documents. And eventually, even the snapback cones themselves were removed in the fourth edition of mooring equipment guidelines. The reason for this was the Zaga incident. The Zaga incident was a snapback event that occurred on board the vessel Zaga at port in the UK in 2015. A UHMPE line parted and struck the officer in charge on deck. Despite the perception that high modulus lines did not recoil, the use of a polyester tail generated sufficient stored energy to cause a snapback event anyway. The line parted and swung off deck before wrapping around the fair lead and coming back on deck on the opposite side of the fair lead, striking the officer in the head. In the investigation of the event, the OCIMF and others demonstrated the first known case of computational analysis of a snapback event, again demonstrating velocities exceeding 200 meters per second. In addition to computational modeling, physical testing was undertaken to understand the differences in snapback behavior between HMPE, polyester, and combined HMPE and polytail lines. The footage on the screen left shows the polyester tail being tested in isolation, and you can see the recoil behavior is significant. Similarly, the right hand side shows just the HMPE line, which barely recoils at all. However, when combined in series, the snapback event is still substantial, as shown in the middle video. The results of this work put mooring equipment guidelines back under the microscope, and the fourth edition was issued in 2018. Mooring equipment guidelines fourth edition was revised and issued the following statements. Although there are areas of increased snapback risk, it is not possible to accurately calculate the whole range of snapback danger zones needed to ensure personnel are safe. Marking snapback danger zones creates a false sense of safety for personnel standing outside of a marked danger zone. And, instead, it is recommended that the entire area of the mooring deck is considered an area of elevated risk, particularly from snapback. At BHP Hay Point in 2020, another event occurred that would change perceptions around snapback. A spring line parted and whipped over the top of the facility. Previously, the operating assumption had been that lines would recall down towards the quick release hooks at the dolphins, yet as shown on screen, this is not always the case. Home Solutions of New Zealand were engaged by BHP to undertake physical testing of a temporary works barrier designed by others in response to this event. The barrier had been designed under the assumption that through force deflection methods it could absorb the energy of a snapback event. That was demonstrated to be completely false. The reality is that a mooring line strikes so fast that the structure fails locally before the shockwave can move through it and generate meaningful deflections. As shown on screen, the results are likely fatal to anyone standing behind such a structure. Subsequent work has shown that failures like this still occur even in larger permanent barriers. I was also personally engaged on this project along with my business WGA. We were tasked with producing theoretical models to describe the motion and velocity of the parted mooring line event. I was able to demonstrate the influence of dynamic buckling and bollard interactions on mooring line path, as can be seen on screen. I was also able to produce spatial heat maps of theoretical velocity of the mooring line at every point throughout its transit. When reviewing the physical testing footage, it can be seen that the same interaction of buckling of the line and the redirection point, as was theoretically predicted, can be observed. There was very close agreement in peak velocity of the mooring line, reaching nearly 400 meters per second at the point of impact. Interestingly, our research shows that the tip velocity could have reached over 600 meters a second had it been arrested just a few meters later. On screen now you can see the envelope of many spring line failures of this type in orange, as well as a particular failure case shown by the white line. Through the analysis of hundreds of thousands of simulations we can create these envelopes that give geometry somewhat similar to the snapback path of mooring equipment guidelines 
albeit informed by direct computational analysis for the particular arrangements of a site and vessel. One such arrangement is shown on screen now, showing a ballast bolt carrier and all of its respective snapback paths. When we compare these paths to the historical snapback cones, we find, unsurprisingly, that they are much larger. My research has shown that in the particular case of short breast lines, the equivalent cone would need to be 37 degrees, not 10, to cover an appropriate area on a dolphin. This is influenced not only by the mooring line behaviour, but by vessel motion, tides, ballast conditions, and structural interactions. Further complicating matters, facilities do not see a design vessel in their operational life. They see thousands, each with unique winch and fair lead locations. This presents a considerable design challenge for port engineers who need to consider thousands of possible mooring arrangements to suitably cover all cases for the design life of a facility. Seaport 21 of Spain have been working on the statistical analysis of these vessels to give idealised positions and distributions of fair lead and winch locations per vessel type, so that port engineers can understand the sensitivity and range they need to consider when designing for snapback events. With this information, port engineers can make informed decisions about the variability of mooring line locations and, by extension, the variability of snapback paths. All of this work has led to the formation of PNC Working Group 251, for which I am the originator of the Terms of Reference and the Chair. Working Group 251's report is titled, Guidance on the Design of Potted Mooring Line Arresting Systems, and intends to provide a holistic summary of all of the necessary considerations for a system of snapback controls. We note, as we refer to it, an arresting system is not a barrier. An arresting system is a system of controls that may or may not include a barrier, that work in conjunction with each other to materially reduce both the likelihood and consequence of snapback events. Assessment for which controls are suitable will require the identification of drivers and frequency of snapback events on a per facility basis, as each site has different factors that contribute to its snapback risk. We will provide guidance on the calculation of snapback velocity and path and how this information can be used to design appropriate controls. We will provide information on the particulars of vessels, including the idealised locations of fair leads and winches on a per-vessel class basis, and the statistical distributions of these locations over our datasets. We will provide guidance on design tension values for snapback events based on site data or background research, as the majority of mooring lines part at tensions much lower than their design capacity. We will provide advice on the theoretical design of arresting structures like barriers and for physical testing of barriers and mooring lines should it be deemed necessary by the facility or designer. We will provide guidance on considerations for low snapback mooring lines and also alternate mooring systems, including dynamic and vacuum systems. And finally, we'll provide recommendations on the recording of incidents to better inform these data sets that are used to make statistical assessments. We can't do this without you though. And to that end, I have formed the Working Group 251 Industry Advisory Forum. The purpose of the Industry Advisory Forum is twofold. One, to allow port authorities, asset owners, and operators around the world to exchange lessons learnt on snapback best practices prior to the finalisation of the Working Group report. And two, to leverage the knowledge of port authorities, asset owners, and operators around the world, including their existing data on snapback events, to provide the best informed basis possible for the recommendations of the Working Group 251 report. Please consider this an invitation to each and every one of you, and I welcome your approaching me to be included. We also note that, in conjunction with the Australian Government, we are currently seeking support for the most comprehensive suite of physical testing of mooring line snapback ever to be undertaken in early 2026. Collection of this data will be critical to supporting the work of Working Group 251. Currently, testing will be undertaken by the following organisations and bodies. Walbridge Gilbert Aztec, WGA, Swinburne University of Melbourne, Australia, Dalrymple Bay Coal Terminal of Queensland, Australia, and Trelleborg. As per OCIMF 1992, it is our obligation to provide our best recommendations for minimum requirements for snapback safety whilst also not standing in the way of future innovation and technological development. We have nearly 80 years of research on this topic by some of the brightest minds known to our industry. 
It is a tragedy if we can stand on the shoulders of giants but choose not to look. Piank is the single most important forum for the collation of this wisdom and its distribution to all, and, most importantly, the work we are doing here today will save lives. I want to thank the members of Piank Working Group 251 who are working tirelessly to bring improved port safety to all, and to each and every one of you for your time listening to me today. Thank you.